And um, this is the 17th meeting um, of the session five of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, could everyone please turn off any electronic um, equipment which may go off, phones, etc., um, as this can actually interfere with the recording of the of the committee. Right, um, so agenda item one um, will be in regards to taking business in private, um, which will be items four and five. Item four is an item on the code of conduct, and item five is to discuss correspondence we have received. And do members agree to take these items in private? Okay, thank you. Agenda item two, then. Uh, agenda item two is in relation to cross-party groups. And um, as for the committee to consider correspondence received from Mr Sammy Steen. In 2017, Mr Steen wrote to the committee to complain about the cross-party group on Palestine. At that time, the convener of the committee, uh, of the committee confirmed that non-MSP membership of that group is a matter for that group and any CPG themselves. Uh, therefore, the CPG on Palestine had not broken rules in relation to its membership arrangements. The focus of the Today's discussion is a letter that Mr Steen subsequently wrote to the committee in March of this year in which he has asked for the rules on CPGs in the Code of Conduct to be reviewed. In this letter, Mr Steen makes five specific recommendations which you have been circulated with. Um, so you should obviously and will have uh, read over uh, those. And before I invite members' views, on Mr Steen's suggestions, I would like to provide a wee bit of background that I hope is relevant on cross-party groups. As you will all know, there are now 104 cross-party groups um, in Parliament which cover a wide range of subjects and issues, some of which are of a sensitive nature. Uh, CPGs are not formal parliamentary business, although they tend to meet in Parliament as MSPs are able to book rooms here, mainly in the evenings when the Parliament is closed. Um, CPGs do not have access to any financial or staffing resources from the Parliament um, for their meetings and the Code of Conduct requires them to respect the limitations on the use of parliamentary facilities. Under the Code of Conduct, any decision about membership is a matter for the group itself and groups are therefore within their rights to refuse non-members entry to the meeting. Now, as members are aware, Changes to the Code of Conduct are normally the subject of detailed consideration and consultation by the committee, and ultimately the decision on whether to make changes is for the Parliament. Okay, so I hope that's straightforward. Um, so may I invite comments from members of the committee, please, in regard to this. Thank you. Elaine Smith, please. Thank you very much, Convener. Um, you know, in carefully reading the paperwork and obviously having been a Member of Parliament, since 1999 and having been involved as a convener and co-convener of various cross-party groups, um, I clearly take a, an interest in this. But I think over those years, I've often believed there's been something of a misunderstanding sometimes about <coughs> excuse me, the purpose of cross-party groups. They're set up by MSPs um, and they're set up so that MSPs can explore a common subject to inform their work and they can do that in what might be considered a, a, a safe space with no party political argy-bargy going on by the very nature of the fact that they're cross-party and you have to get cross-party to set them up. Um, and so, in terms of that, if, if those groups aren't working out and they're not informing MSPs' work, then, of course, they could also be dissolved by those MSPs and only by the MSPs as a, as a decision for the MSPs. What they're not is public meetings, and I have had to uh, sometimes explain that to um, cross-party groups that I've been involved with. And in actual fact, most of them take place, not all of them, but most of them take place in the evenings in Parliament, and the Parliament actually closes to the public at six o'clock at night. So, you know, it's clear from that that they're not, they're not public meetings. Um, and actually, I had an issue recently where some members of the public wanted to come to a meeting that I was convening, and I had to change the timing of the meeting. I did it in line with the rules of cross-party groups. I had to do that because the MSPs couldn't um, 
couldn't comply with the original timings, but the members of the public that had wanted to come and listen didn't get that message, if you like, because they weren't members across party groups, they didn't check the website, and so they turned up rather late. But the meeting has to run for the MSPs, and as I say, I did it in line with the rules for cross-party groups and, and how you advertise the meetings. Um, I think there's also confidentiality issues in some of the cross-party groups that I've been involved with. Um, so it seems to me that it would be reasonable that office bearers who are mainly, well, certainly the conveners are MSPs, um, that they would be taking decisions. As I say, they could take the decision to actually dissolve the cross-party group if it wasn't working out. Um, but another point about that is if other MSPs involved with the group don't don't like the direction that those conveners are taking, then there is an AGM and conveners can be um, asked to step down that way. And can I just also finish with the fact that I think some cross-party groups, again, that I've been involved with, have sensitive issues. They, they, they um, have to deal with members, members of that group who might want to share experiences in a safe space to do that. Um, so, therefore, I think we need to be cognisant of that fact as well when we're considering this issue. And finally, could I just say, I don't think that this committee could possibly <coughs> be involved with micromanaging cross-party groups. It has to be up to the cross-party groups. In terms of the rules that we have, where, how, how they, they run their operations, how they run their groups. Thank you very much, Elaine. Uh, Gil, Patterson. Yes, thanks very much for that. <coughs> okay, yes, uh, I wonder if I could uh, explain to the committee uh, some experience that I had. In 1999, I set up the first uh, cross-party group on men's violence against women and children. And the makeup of that group uh, were, uh, uh, for instance, rape crisis, zero tolerance, women's aid, a whole, a whole host of organisations that are you know, quite quite large and some small ones. And in the early stages of that, it, that received some publicity. And it, in the early stages, the, the group had been set up, can't remember exactly how many months into the group, but it was fairly early on. I was approached uh, by letter uh, or by email from a number of men. And the men uh, were insistent that the group should also include violence against men. And I made a decision as a convener that uh, they asked for two things. They asked to, that the resident of the group should contain that element of it. And they also asked if they could attend, and I declined both. Um, I didn't, going from memory, I'm sure I didn't seek anyone's approval. To be quite honest, I did it as a convener. Uh, the meeting was just due to come up, and I didn't want people turning up and be disappointed, so I, 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 I said no to both. I then took it to the group itself and explained the circumstances of it, and it was a big group. Uh, it still is a big group to this day, and everyone agreed with my action, so the group actually agreed. It Maybe the one thing I should have done is I should maybe have counselled opinion I'm fairly certain that I didn't. So two things were coming from that, in my view. People who, I, I did say to them, I've got to say, I should say this also, it's important, that there's clearly violence against men, but it tends to be violence by men on men. And there's clearly violence with women against men. There's no question about that. But the what our focus was is on the effects on women and children rather than men. And I encouraged the men to, if they thought that they had wanted to pursue that, that they should try and for or engage with MSPs. It wouldn't be me and it wouldn't be my group, but I encouraged them if they wished, they should actually form a group, a cross-party group themselves. It is an issue and it may be needed to be heard. They weren't very pleased at that. So they were still pretty insistent that they should be able to attend uh, the meeting. So therefore, I think that cross, you know, I, I don't want to talk about specifics other than give that example, but to look at the range of groups that we have, and as Elaine has already, uh, you can imagine a group such as Men's Violence Against Women and Children, you can Im imagine some of the issues that are likely to be there. Uh, and, of course, victims uh, it, were there also. 
And the idea that someone uh, um, wanted to be in that group and the group were uncomfortable with that, I think would be problematic. And then there's the, the, the other uh, issue of access uh, 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 to the group. So there's, there's, the, there's the mission statement and access. And uh, the fact that uh, opening it up to the public, uh, if you open it up to the public, then the press are there. And in a group like the Men's Violence Against Women and Children, the last thing that you would want would be for the press to be involved in, in that. It just would not happen. Uh, there wouldn't, would never be a meeting if the press sat in on that meeting. So I, I, these, the, these are the operational matters that, that lets a group function properly. It lets people talk about very, very serious things to enlighten MSPs. They are trying to influence, no question about that. They're there to explain and, uh, of what's happening in, in the real world in a private space. And, and in my view, it must be in a private situation. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Gil. Um, Mark Roscoe, please. Yeah, thanks, convener. I mean, I think it, it, it's actually quite useful getting a letter like this because it does allow us to reflect on, you know, the purpose of cross-party groups and also their function. Uh, you know, so I welcome that. However, I mean, I, I do agree with Elaine Smith and Gil Patterson here that you know, that there's a misunderstanding here about what cross-party groups actually are. Um, you know, they are private meetings. They might be taking place uh, within the building, within a, within a public institution, but they are ultimately private meetings. So I, I do feel that the, the recommendations that have been suggested to us are, are, are not appropriate uh, in, in that context. Um, there, there are two recommendations in here about providing reasons for rejection of application and reasons uh, for expulsions as well. Um, I, I mean, I could see how some cross-party groups may be in a position to provide reasons. I mean, it might be the polite thing to do. But I can also see uh, particular cross-party groups that are working with vulnerable people where there are sensitivities. I think we've heard the, the example already from, from Gil. Where actually providing a formal statement of reasons would absolutely not be appropriate in that case. So I think trying to, you know, trying to sort of create a, uh, a, a, a sort of management manual for CPGs in this committee, I don't feel is appropriate. We have got a huge amount of diversity, as Kavina said. We've got 104 CPGs. They cover a wide variety of topics. They cover some extremely vulnerable people as well. Um, and I think it, it comes down to the individual CPG to determine themselves what's appropriate in the way that they manage. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't accept these recommendations. Um, but I do think it, it's useful they've come in front of us because it does enable us to reflect on where we're at. Okay, thank you very much, Mark. Um, Jim, do you want to? Thanks very much, Kavina. Yeah, I, I mean, again, there's a lot I agree, agree with, uh, and I recognise the points that have been made by Elaine um, and by Gil and, and, and by Mark. Um, both about the suitability of people to uh, uh, be able to attend or have a, effectively, uh, you know, everybody to be able to attend every event, um, and also that, uh, you know, that the, the, the makeup of cross-party groups, what they actually are. I think where I have concerns is that the, the perception of what cross-party groups may well be very different, the public perception to, to actually how they're constituted within, within the Code of Conduct, within the kind of Parliament. Um, and that therefore does have a bearing on how th that reflects on how we do business here. Now, you know, uh, short of educating everybody and saying, you know, absolutely, uh, this is what they are, uh, that we have to recognise that. Um, I suppose where where I would look is essentially I would believe that the default position should be that people should be able to attend cross-party party groups, where there are particular instances, as have been outlined today, uh, and th there will be other reasons. Then, then it is then it is acceptable, or it is right, or it is fair that some people may be excluded from those groups. I do also feel, though, that again the default position should be, uh, where possible, where practical, it should be good practice to advise those people of their reasons. I again accept that there won't always be, there will be circumstances where that is not possible because, again, of the reasons outlined um, today. But I do think uh, it would it would be good practice practice in normal circumstances to advise people why they may be refused membership or excluded from cross-party groups. 
Thank you, thank you, Jimmy. Um, Tom? Tom? Yes, um, being comparatively new to this, um, I do reflect that the, these trust party groups do need a large degree of freedom to what they do. But uh, there is the necessity of good practice and good manners in terms of any in, in, in decisions they make. So I think some explanation uh, as a normality might be appropriate to encourage. And I do. I think the word encourage and nor normal may be a thing, and there are definitely incidents where that would not be appropriate. But that's the judgment of the of the group and the, and the the chairman and the MSPs appropriate for that, those particular groups, because they are very varied in what they do. Some really do like public exposure, and they can get it quite easily. And there are those who really need to go into very detailed private matters, because some of the issues discussed in some of them are very personal and very private. And any any public exposure would be, and any reason given publicly might be detrimental to certain individuals. So a, a light touch, but with some guidance as to what might be good practice, would be, I'd go along with. Thank you very much, Tom. Um, Maureen, what do you wish to say? Yes, um, I mean, in the vast majority of cases, all par cross-party groups work well, but there have been occasions, I think Elaine, you were involved in one that had to be dissolved because it just ended up being unworkable, and that's a very rare occurrence. And as other members have said, most of them are as open and transparent um, as possible. But we have to be aware that sometimes matters do get in such a complicated state um, that actions in order to keep the cross party working properly have to be taken, or else we end up dissolving it. And that's often not a very good situation for some of the people who've been involved in the cross-party group and see it in some cases as very much a support group really. Um, so I think it is important, as others have said, that cross-party groups are as open and transparent and discuss what actions they're taking in what can be a very difficult situation, but a very rare situation. Okay, thank you, Maureen. Um, okay, I think, uh, does anyone have anything else they wish to contribute at the moment? Okay, I think um, there's been a... Everyone has had a, a good opportunity to express themselves. There's a wee bit variation, but there's a broad general direction. Um, so, potential... Um, approach that as a committee, and it'll be for the committee to decide whether this is right or wrong, it might be um, for the clerks of the committee uh, to contact all cross-party groups, um, all 104, uh, with a reminder about the rules on membership of CPGs as it stands in the Code of Conduct. The clerks, in doing so, can remind cross-party groups that any decisions about membership, including whether to limit the number of non-MSP members, they are a matter for the group themselves. But in addition, the clerks can suggest that cross-party groups might or may, depending on their circumstances, wish to reflect on how they can ensure an appropriate level of transparency in their decisions on membership. Does that seem reasonable? Um, yes, uh, Gil Parson, please. Yeah, I think so. I, I, I'm always conscious about law and instruments or advice and we've, we've got to be careful that whatever we're deciding it's for the slow ship in the convoy so what you've described there I think would cover all the groups and not cause any disturbance in any way and it would be good practice so It's getting good practice as uh, yeah, I think so. approach um, yeah. and anyone else have a further contribution at the moment Okay um, well we will then go forward with this approach. Um, the clerks will take that forward on behalf of the committee and report back to us. Um, and I think that will be the agenda item at the moment. Um, OK, thank you. Close. Thank you, everyone. Um, OK. Agenda item three is um, Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland and it's a committee to agree the commencement and transitional arrangements for the revised direction to the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland 
Um, the committee previously approved the revised direction. The committee is now required to approve the commencement date and transitional arrangements set out in the cover note which you received. Uh, do members agree the commencement and transitional arrangements as provided? Agreed. Agreed. Okay, thank you very much for that. And um, that ends the public part of this meeting. We did agree to take items four and five in private, so that is the public sector. Okay, thank you very much to everyone.